Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Eve, welcome back to Wilms Front. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now you're one of the Victorians who after being trapped in our police state lockdown for, for so long, has been part of the, the mass migration out and up north, setting up a, a new life in southeast Queensland. What cultural differences have you noticed between the t- two states? Obviously, they've had different restrictions uh, for so long, but uh, there's, as we've noticed over the past year, distinct cultures between the various states. Uh, as in, like, regardless of the whole situation, I would say that cultural differences are, and this is something that I have observed before, people in uh, Queensland or even just sunnier parts of Australia are definitely a lot happier, and that's definitely the case up here, very observable. And, of course, with the restrictions having been eased here for so long, uh, there is a sense of normality up here, uh, and then <laughs> sometimes I do see the odd passerby um, walking, you know, with a mask and they look very, very serious. Maybe I'm just uh, taking my imagination too far, but it would appear that they almost look like disgruntled at all the at all the other people not wearing a mask. But people seem to be happy here. Um, and yeah, no one really mentions COVID-19. And what about the because obviously every state now has their their, their contact tracing or QR code check-ins. Mm. Uh, it, how, it, how is that enforced by the venues? Is it... Uh, it doesn't appear to be enforced too seriously. Um, yeah, I certainly don't take it very seriously. You can uh, decipher whatever it is that that means for you. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, some people actually, like, I hear I, I overhear people saying, like, oh, you know, should we check in? Like, even just walking past places, you know, some people are really staying on to it. I mean, whatever, if that helps you sleep at night. But the general attitude towards it is, uh, I would say, oh, yeah, like, whatever, do it. But then there's also a lot of people who are just like, ugh, this is, like, you know, pointless and silly. And I like a lot of people, um, they actually completely... Uh, avoid it like they really make an effort to go around it and make sure that they're not checking in Uh, but yeah it's not it's not taken as seriously that's for sure did you get uh, stuck in that uh, snap three-day lockdown that the greater brisbane area endured in january no fortunately i uh did not i was traveling around northern new south wales at that point um yeah just around new south wales in general so no but friends of mine were and even the friends of mine that were (laughs) left brisbane for the weekend they were like see ya i'm out yeah because there was no ring of steel that uh, they they put up in the what is it nine hours notice that's the only time that uh, an area of queensland was uh, forced to be masked up which most notably if you're driving solo in your car which that even topped Dan's mask rules. <laughs> it's laughable, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, like here in Victoria, the, the, the mask uh, rules have been slowly relaxed. Uh, uh, Friday night I- is when uh, everyone can ditch them in, in retail settings. So a lot of people have already taken it upon themselves to, to, to ditch them. Um, there the i think the 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 main impact of that is uh, most of the 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 mask uh karens or the 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 ones that you experience there will have lost all their all their power and authority they'll just (laughs) be in the in their mask just frowning at uh, all the people who (laughs) are no longer wearing them yeah um it really did seem that that was going on a long time in Victoria. On my recent visit down there, I was down there for uh, the New Year period. And um, it was actually just like, it it felt so foreign just because I'd been out of the state for such a long time. uh, And it was really weird to be there and observing people like wearing their masks and yeah, still taking it quite seriously. And me, I mean, I, 
I think I, I wore a mask maybe on like one or two occasions. Um, I can't remember, even remember exactly what it was, but I definitely never took it seriously. And I obviously thought the whole thing was laughable and I haven't been wearing, I hadn't been wearing a mask. Um, and yeah, being in the shopping centres and just public spaces, indoor public spaces, when that was the situation in Victoria, um, it just, yeah, it was a very different energy to how it had been up in the sunny estates. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm glad, obviously, for Victorians that that's not going to be the case anymore, but I can't believe that people have even stuck to it that long anyway. I didn't get approached by a single person, no police officer, and people re would recognise me. They would stare. Like, if I wear my Cobra hat, people know who I am. Um, and um, people pointing and laughing and that type of thing. But it's amazing to me just how many people will do it because they're just afraid like oh I don't want to cause trouble this and that but you know I mean good for you guys down there in Victoria I'm glad that that's the case but if people are sitting around waiting for Big Daddy to tell them whether or not it's okay to wear a mask it just tells me that they're just going to be sitting there waiting for waiting to be told what to do next and they'll just gladly accept it um, without thinking to challenge it. And that seems to be how most people think in the they, they just wait until well it, it, it they, they just follow it and think that well if it's being mandated by the government as for our own good we've got to uh, respect the law on that but I, I i've noticed uh, since the announcement was made on on tuesday i don't know why it's coming into effect 6 p.m friday that's really weird so you're at what is it chadston shopping center it's 5 59 you have to wear mask and then clock ticks over to uh, six and everyone in the shopping center can can, to me, can it's take just it like off. another thing of like, you know, jump and then how high? It's like, we're going to do exactly, you're going to do exactly what we say. And it's down to the minute, you know, it's like at this time, it's okay. But any time before that, it's not. It's actually quite, it's embarrassing for people who actually choose to follow it because they're just, they're just little puppets. So maybe that's just like, if I were the one putting such things into power, I'd be having a laugh about it. Like, oh, look what I can make the stupid people do. Yeah, it, that, that's definitely the, the most alarming thing, that no matter how draconian the, the, the measure that a government introduced, such as the, the in Brisbane, uh, driving solo, you had to, had to wear a mask, people uh, comply with that. But I've noticed since the, 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 the announcement, a lot of Victorians are like, yeah, can't wait to uh, take it off, breathe again. Oh. Yeah, I never really liked them anyway. Oh gosh, it's just, <laughs> I, I see it as entertainment now, honestly, because I, at least up here in um, sunny Queensland, there's not, uh, there's, there's not really so much of that happening anyway. And then when I do see people complying and, you know, oh, but we still have to social distance. Um, there's so few of those people that for me, at least I can be able to laugh at it now because those people, at least up here, are the minority. And that's not because um, they're, my, they're the minority in the sense that all the other people up here would also resist and choose to not wear a mask. It's just because at the moment such things aren't being mandated like they are down there till 6 p.m. on Friday. And I also think the, the, the novelty of wearing a mask thinking that you're saving lives has worn off. And that was certainly well, when the, the mask mandate uh, first came into effect, first in Greater Melbourne, then all of Victoria. I was never a fan of it, neither were you. Everyone was like, well, there's all these people falling ill with COVID. We just have to wear a mask and we're saving lives. That's, oh, God, I, 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 I know, sibling. yes. And it's still because there, there's still lots of uh, hundreds of thousands of COVID cases overseas every day. There's still even a year on, despite the livelihoods that it's destroyed, the stay home, save lives, mantra which just seems like a the, the ult <laughs> ultimate N npc line like if you're still saying that a year on yeah yeah oh it is exactly that it's npc um like state of mind yeah <laughs> it's just virtue signaling and i guess people need something to feel good about with their lives and they're too scared to actually go out and think for themselves so it's like oh well you know the powers that be are saying to do this uh, and this makes me a good little goy guy, um, and um, so I'll do that. It's just so silly. <laughs> 
And when you learnt that Dan had fallen down the stairs and broken his ribs and fractured his vertebrae, what was your initial reaction? Okay, so that's only the second time that I've heard about it. The first time was, I, I don't even fully know what it was. Um, well, none of us really do. We, we were told that, or he told us that he slipped on some wet stairs on his way to work and I tumbled down. I someone just <laughs> gave him, <laughs> I think someone probably just gave him what he had coming and that's just his cover story. I don't know. Um, look, I mean, I don't actually wish um, physical harm onto him. Um, I just wish he'd not be in a position of power. I'm trying to be diplomatic and, you know, I'm trying to change my life for Jesus. So don't make me say something aggressive because I'm trying to be better. <laughs> well, let's turn to that now because you, you haven't just uh, m uh, moved uh, your life up north. Uh, you've changed your, your life and uh, your lifestyle. You're no longer an erotic uh, dancer. You've, you've turned to... Uh, God and you've been staying at a at a convent now I'm not uh, religious so you'll have to explain to me what a convent is okay I just want to clarify uh, it's actually it's amazing to me how people can find out one thing and then all of a sudden turn it into this whole other thing it's like jumping to conclusions like here's a step and then there's like you know, they just jump all the way to here rather than like going here, like there. <laughs> um, so I stayed in a convent. I don't live in a convent. Um, I don't intend to live in a convent. That's not where my life is. Uh, but a convent, I will clarify, is where nuns live. So I was staying in an Orthodox convent, Russian Orthodox convent down in the Snowy Mountains of New South Wales and it was by recommendation of uh, one of my orthodox priests um, who is close with the clergy there and um, it was just a really amazing time for me there's hardly any phone reception out there so it's really easy to just switch off and drop away from everything that's happening in the outside world and i think religious or not that that is good for absolutely anybody because so many people including myself just we're all nature deficient really so it was really wonderful to just be out in the bush i actually grew up uh in that area in a small town only 40 minutes away uh, a lot of my childhood was spent growing up there rather um so it was just a really peaceful and quiet time for me uh, to spend time around women who are obviously close to God, uh, learn how to be a better woman, a more godly woman, and um, read. Lots of reading, going down to the river, obviously lots of church. There's a little chapel at the convent, and then there's also the men's monastery, which has, of course, monks, which is uh, just a, on a couple of blocks over. And um, yeah, it was just a, a really fabulous time and I'm really excited to go back. In fact, I am going to be going back for um, Orthodox Easter, Pascha, which falls on my birthday. You definitely make it sound uh, so lovely and, and peaceful and especially us uh, Victorians have been cooped up for, for so much of this year, uh, mm -hmm. just being out in uh, remote nature because this is what we've forgotten about this 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 whole time that well, Australia it's so large there's so much to to see there's so much beauty in it obviously the the the, the weather and uh, politics have been a bit ugly the the, the past week uh, but yeah there there's so much more uh, outside four walls oh definitely and i've really been enjoying doing that um with the oh gosh i hate how it sounds like with the freedom that i have it's like this is the freedom that we all have and i feel like um you know people are feeling like they, they're grateful that their freedoms are being given back it's like well hang on these are our god-given freedoms these are these are our birthrights and we're all of a sudden grateful about it like i saw gladys berejiklian is that um is that right is premier that yeah premier of new south wales yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you pronounce so it she, right um, yeah cool um, so she made an announcement and it popped up on my YouTube suggestions about easing of restrictions in New South Wales. And for a moment, I mean, I'm based in Queensland now, obviously, but even for a moment, I, um, I found myself thinking like, oh, like, this is great. Oh, she's such a good woman. I'm like, okay, like, I don't know enough about her to 
criticize or critique or anything, but for a moment I was like pr praising her, being like, see, this is what everyone else needs to do. She's so wonderful. She's so great. It's like, why did this happen to begin with? Like, we're celebrating for getting our um, freedoms back, but they never should have been stripped from us anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get exactly what what you mean, that uh, uh, freedom freedom uh, shouldn't come from from government it should it, it comes well you as a it's christian innate. it's yeah it's a it, it comes from from god yeah yeah i mean like for a non-christian whatever you might want to call i mean unless you're an atheist i don't i don't know but like whatever you want to call it what's created us it's like that's that's where our freedom comes from yeah now, your virtual court appearance at the, the Melbourne Magistrates Court uh, over allegedly refusing to give your name and address to Victoria Police when they, they smashed your car window uh, in, in Carlton back in, in late July, uh, yeah. that, that again attracted the attention of the, the mainstream media and led to a new round of, of social media chatter about you and your checkpoint crossing. I know that uh, I noticed in my uh, YouTube studio, a few more comments pop up on our previous uh, chat back in uh, September. Now- oh gosh, what they have to say? <laughs> Oh, how irresponsible you were and fame hungry, not uh, considerate of the, the people who suffered with, with COVID. <laughs> so it's basically a rerun of the, 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 the online rages against you uh, back, oh, at, back yeah, at that time. Oh, yeah, they're just milking it, Tim. So I remember you said that... Uh, uh, well, I'm not sure, I can't remember if you said that you received a, a fine in the mail. That's what the, the news article said. Um, yeah, so I, um, for a while they were saying like, oh, Eve Black is facing up to $10,000 in fines. <laughs> um, so I can't remember when that was around, like uh, when, when we spoke the first time, but uh, I did end up receiving a fine and it was for 1650 whatever dollars. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so I said obviously that I wanted to contest it. And then as a result of that, um, I sent off some paperwork, uh, which they completely like dismissed and all that kind of thing. And then it was so funny. Um, cops rocked up to me to hand me over um, um, a summons to court anyway. So I received the summons and I looked through the charge sheet and the statements and everything that were on there. And it was actually laughable. Um, when did they, thing, they give this to you, this the, the summons? Because I remember at the, the time of the, the window smashing, the, the men's, the, well, Victoria Police said you'd been charged on summons, but you hadn't received the summons when we last spoke. Right, so I received the summons. I wouldn't be able to tell you the exact date unless I went and actually got the piece of pa the papers myself right now. Um, but it was sometime in in September, um, and then yeah, it said that the court date was for the twenty third of March, so yesterday. Um, yeah, so on the piece of paper, um, uh, it was weird because it's like the fine was. Uh, originally sent saying that I'd breached restrictions so that I was like, you know, traveling when I wasn't supposed to be traveling. But then the actual charge sheet for the summons to court said that the charges were for failing to produce um, identification and license. And that when I did produce my identification that I gave a uh, false name and address. Like, that's what they're trying to charge me for, but the fine was for breaching COVID restrictions. So not only are those things incongruent, but on top of that, there were four statements in the summons that were provided by the officers who were around there on the day. Two of the attending officers were the ones that I interacted with. The other two were um, surrounding where I was staying and verifying that it was me leaving the building when I, when I did. Now, the two um, attending officers who I um spoke with the ones that arrested me um they wrote in their statements that i gave my name and address N no part of their statement at all says that i lied or gave incorrect information so 
it doesn't make any sense for one thing. And then a, a laughable clerical error, which is that they called me a male. So there's that too. It's like, are you really looking at this paperwork? Like, are you, are you, th these, these statements and this charge and the summons to court is supposed to be written under oath, no? Like, they're supposed to know what they're talking about. Like, this is supposed to be like a legal document. Uh, and now they're trying to charge me for something which not only did I not commit, but they also wrote in their statements did not happen. That's perjury, trying to charge me for something which didn't happen. So that's that's what actually went down um, with, yes, with yesterday's court appearance. Uh, my legal advisor and I just told them that. I can't plead guilty or not guilty to something that did not happen. And and this is what the the, the mainstream media uh, report. Uh, this, if I go to the, if I go to the the seven seven news one, it lists that it was uh, written by Karen Sweeney of uh, oh, AAP. Karen. Was, Karen. so it was a a virtual court appearance. I'm not sure how the, these sort of things work. Whether you can see if there's journalists uh, on the call, right. Uh, so the way that that happened was I, um, I was fully prepared to be uh, on camera, but when I spoke to the registrar on the phone from the magistrate's court in the morning, she said that you do not need to appear on camera. So I was like, you know what, like, I don't want to, you know, give them more material to take a picture with than they'd probably like film the entire thing and then just get my my face at one moment where it was like looking i, I looking still stupid. don't i, I think because it's still a court of law they can't use photos from that right you're you're quite possibly correct um yeah i just didn't even want to you know need to like there's no point i don't need to have the camera on i don't need to be seen for the interaction so i have no use for it um but that kind of runs contrary to what everyone thinks, which is that, oh, Eve, she wants the attention. Um, no, I don't, but anyway. Um, so no, the camera was not on. There were quite a few uh, attendees in the virtual courtroom. When I did speak to the, re the registrar on the phone a couple of weeks prior, I was calling to wonder about uh, how I would make it happen online. And then when she said that you can do it online, I was like, oh, this is great. So. Uh, does that mean that no media personnel will be able to actually participate because it's not going to be in a physical courtroom? Like someone can't just walk into the courtroom like they would any other situation. And she said, no, actually, anybody who desires to have the link can have the link. So I was like, oh, great. So there was probably about up to 15 other um, users who were in the virtual courtroom. Wow. Only a couple of them had visual. Um, so yeah, it was definitely the media. The one media person who did speak out was requesting for uh, consent from the magistrate, said that they were from ABC News um, and that they wanted access to the files because they believe that this should be public knowledge. My legal advisor then said that I wanted to, um, that we wanted to uh, keep the matter private. And then of course, because, you know, they're paid off, they're all on the same team, blah, blah, blah. The magistrate said, no, I do think it's important that the public know this. Well, let's uh, turn to your uh, legal advisor. And uh, he was was known as Zeb uh, Secured it's Party Zeb, Predator. They got that wrong. It's Zeb. No, not you. Zeb, Zeb. they got it wrong. And they described uh, your appearance as uh, bizarre and made reference to Zev's uh, parrot uh, that made noises during the the, the court appearance. Mm. And well, the, the the article gives the the, the vibe uh, that Zev is a legal kook who doesn't really know what he's talking about. Right, when really he actually just tore them a new one because he knew exactly what he was talking about. I remember when I first actually spoke to, sorry, the second time I spoke to the registrar on the phone, which was on the morning of, so yesterday, and I asked to clarify, will I be able to have uh, a representative on my behalf to speak with when I am uh, in the virtual courtroom? And she said, as long as it's like a, a lawyer. And I was like, okay, well, my person has obviously history. Um, in a legal capacity, but is not formally recognised as a lawyer by what you would consider like government the, Australian. Yeah, the article says he's a paralegal. Yeah. So, but 
he obviously knew the right things to say to dismiss what it is that they said because they said, oh, no, you can only have a, a lawyer represent you, um, which is obviously not correct. He knew exactly what he needed to say and he did it so well, but, you know, they, they wouldn't advertise that. He, like, he delivered so well and I was just, I was so proud and glad to be having him on my side representing me. He just did so phenomenally well. Uh, he was using terminology that they didn't recognise because they don't even understand the system to the extent that he does. They only understand the system as they have been taught it. Um, but he, uh, he, did, he did phenomenally well. And um, they, they do the parrot thing because they want to embarrass him. Um, he's pet sitting for somebody. So the parrot happened to make a squawking noise in the background. And of course, he said, sorry, that was my parrot. Where, behind the camera, I was like, um, ugh, like when he said that, not because there's anything wrong with like the parrot. I mean, like, obviously, it's not ideal that the parrot made a squawking noise in that situation. But it's more that he said, sorry, that's my parrot, because I know that that's just ammunition for them. Like if they didn't have the whole parrot thing, what? Like, what would their main angle have been? They use the words bizarre to basically discredit anything. Well, there's this here where uh, it describes, well, it states that Zev asked the magistrate to grant a plea in abatement, which could allow the matter to be discharged. And the, the magistrate has, has said uh, that was something that uh, didn't, well, so it wasn't something that existed in the court and said it seemed as if Black wanted to plead not guilty. So they've said that But he how is... is that? See, that's just, it's just incorrect because it, whatever, like, what Zev requested is exactly what ended up going ahead because how can you get somebody to plead guilty or not guilty to something that did not happen? It's not relevant to the situation at all. So I can't plead guilty or not guilty to something that didn't happen. Yeah, I, as you stated before, but uh, that you well, you didn't provide uh, false or misleading information, but from what you've described to, to, to me uh, initially uh, about uh, when the, the police uh, smashed your car window, because you didn't provide your name and address instantly, that seems to be enough for them to charge you with refusing to give name, a name and address because you didn't state it right away. And obviously there's, there, there was a massive uh, target on you at the time where they mm -hmm. wanted to throw in this do you know what the the penalty is if you're found guilty of 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 this offense no and you know what and the and the police officer the informant he was he was present for the virtual um court session and um he didn't have a thing to say not a thing to say it's embarrassing for them it is absolutely embarrassing uh, all he said, actually, was, I'd like to confirm that um, Miss Limbiriu is actually consenting of um, this person to represent her. So we, so then I said, yes, I do consent for Zev to be my um, legal representative. That was it. He didn't I'm open not his mouth. I'm not sure if you've uh, been, well, uh, been keeping up, uh, but it's been revealed that there's uh, close to... 40,000 fines uh, being issued by Victoria Police during the, the course of the, the pandemic state of emergency. There's an apparent backlog of three years, and but yet they're, they're, they're adding this charge to, 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 to your fine, which obviously sl uh, clogs up the justice system further because the article states your next court appearance isn't until july the first so that's incredibly slow justice yeah yes it is um and it's actually the amount of time and energy that is being dedicated into persecuting me is far beyond the um the amount of money that they would receive like as in the energy exchange that would be received by me paying the fine so if the fine is sixteen hundred and fifty two dollars so much more than $1,652 worth of time, energy, and resources has gone into persecuting me. But that's because it is not, the, not about the money, at least in my case. It is about destroying me 
personally so that also it intimidates other people into cooperating. Uh, Victoria Police, uh, they're, they're, they're hesitant to uh, disclose how many fi uh, fines they've had to withdraw for, for obvious reasons. <laughs> yes, exactly. And well, there's, as I said, there's a, there's a huge existing backlog that they, they have to deal with, but they, they maintain that they're going to go after all of them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what I can say to that other than, yeah, of course, I'd be embarrassed too. <laughs> Now, as as you've mentioned, you don't pay that much attention to to the news cycle, or uh, or you never really did be before you became Correct. in the in the news cycle. Uh, but uh, with the or, uh, the Australian Parliament House uh, 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 sex scandals, the allegations of sexual misconduct and ass and assault, uh, it's triggered funny. a lot of uh, conversations about the, the treatment of women in the workplace and women's safety in publics. You worked uh, in arguably the most sexualized workplace for many years. And last year when your checkpoint video went viral, you experienced much gendered and sexualized online abuse. So what's your opinion on this uh, latest Me Too movement, or I call it Me Too 2.0? <laughs> um, well, I think that I've come to a point where I see just how very wrong uh, I was for being in that industry. So while I don't think that it was right uh, to condemn me based on that, like me, I was going to say me, me having done that job doesn't necessarily discredit my opinion, but at the same time, I've come to a point now where I see that, well, certain people, depending on how they live their lives, yes, I would say that it does give you an indication as to whether or not they're of sound mind. It's obviously not, you know, a firm principle to go by because, of course, I still stand by my actions and defending our freedoms, but I was clearly not in sound mind and not in a good place as a woman because a woman's place is not in a strip club nor in the workforce, period, to be honest. I don't think that women should be in the workforce. And you might be like, oh, well, you know, it's not the 1940s anymore, but I think the, the 1940s is where I'd actually like to go back to. So I do condemn that industry. And of course, I condemn the persecution of people just because of their sexual behavior. But I think that that needs to be taken into consideration and I condemn promiscuity from both men and women. I don't think that this is just a woman only problem. Um, so calling someone a slut might sound like a really horrible thing to do. Um, and yeah, sure, it's mean, but uh, people need to be called out if they're behaving promiscuously because I don't believe that that's a very good way to conduct yourself, man or woman. Uh, now that you've mentioned that which there, there's also been a lot of talk about, well, why well, is uh, this situation still an issue in 2020? And there's been a lot of talk about the the, the porn culture, how easily accessible porn is, how it desensitizes particularly a lot of young people to, well, you were, well I don't think heinous is the right word, but uh, quite, uh, you, you, you would say quite, uh, quite uh, unpleasant sexual acts. Yeah, I mean, I entirely condemn the porn industry. It's absolutely messed up. I'm a big um, supporter of the idea that, pan that porn should be completely abolished. Um, it's, it's, it's dangerous in so many ways, not just because it obviously affects the psyche, the developing psyche of a young person who has access to that type of thing, but also like the means in which porn is available just online, anywhere free. We don't know the sources of such things. Like maybe people have like uh, what would be like a rape fantasy um, thing that's like being, you search for that type of thing on like Pornhub or whatever it is. Um, like there is no way for people to know whether or not that was actually a real, um, like the actors who are doing that, or that's actually a real case of gang rape or whatever it is. Like, well, you'd hope it would be actors that, right, but it's uh, despite the, yeah, yeah. Des uh, despite the uh, artistic representation, you hope that it's all consensual. 
right and that's just not the case um, so at what point can we say it's like oh well it's fine because um, you know the acting appears to be real like that it, that shouldn't even need to come into question it's just it is it is dirty, it is an abomination, it is filth, and I absolutely condemn it. And this is not just because Jesus told me so. From a very objective perspective, I can see that porn, promiscuity, it all, it is incredibly damaging for the soul. And it is just no good. I know pagans who are in the, um, in the traditionalist movement, so obviously not Christian, uh, and they're big on the no fap and, um, you know, abolish porn and all that type of thing. It's, um, it's a means to control the masses and it basically subdues men into being compliant, sex-driven, sex-addicted men, uh, boys that basically worship the pussy um, and they're slaves to it. And it's, it's disgusting because it's turning men into weak little cucks. And uh, the other issue I mentioned is is women's safety. I'm not sh I'm not sure if how you feel when you uh, go out at night, not for say like to a restaurant or something at night, but say if you're just ducking down to the Seven Eleven for mm -hmm. uh, milk and bread at eleven o'clock at night. There, there's right. been there. It's been circulated that uh, women use their well uh, clinch their keys as like makeshift weapons to for self-defense is that something you've ever done describe your definitely it's absolutely something that i've done um at the same time i think like excuse me <clears throat> i just i think that women are also going out and doing things that they're not supposed to be doing so i'm not saying that you know going out and dressing like a whore um and being out at two o'clock in the morning makes it justified for things to happen to you but you've also got to think about what's your role that you're playing in such things so obviously that's a stark like there's a stark contrast between that and going out to get milk and bread from the 7-eleven and the point is that anything can happen at any time so i don't think it's a case of oh well men just need to learn to not whatever it's like women as well i think everybody can be um probably playing a part it's a it's a it's a really um it's a tricky topic and i would say that i've got some incredibly conservative very traditional seemingly alt-right wing perspectives on things that i would say could could cause too much of a stir if i went into too much depth but i will say that um yes my views are what people would consider archaic and i think that before in those times when things were archaic there was a lot less problems with the world i'll i'll leave it at that and say that it's a joint effort i i think there were those sort of problems back what is it 80 years ago but it was kept all secret back then there's definitely women are much more empowered these days to to speak up about sexual harassment and assault the fact that that we're hearing such such stories uh, back in 80 years ago that was never it was it was never spoken about uh, at all but uh, with regard to as uh, if you say that uh, a, a woman should take precautions at night you're called victim blaming excusing rape culture but obviously like i've been campaigning against lockdowns for the whole year like you should be able to leave your home at any time including two in the morning to to do what ever you want uh, but unfortunately uh throughout history there are monsters um that's, that's not the just... world that we live in you can't do whatever it is that you want to do you can't go and you know walk around in a thong and then not be called slut and be like oh i demand respect well you don't get respect because you're like you it's not a perfect world. That's not the world that we live in. So you've got to live according to the circumstances, not according to your ideology. And I will wear the fact that I have been that person. So yes, I deserve to be slut shamed for my past because I was being a freaking hoe. I'm not proud of my past. I'm proud of how far I've come. Absolutely. But I own that. And yes, I condemn it. Um, I think that women need to not be so naive and to think, well, I'm a woman and I'm empowered. But you're not empowered because you're dressing like a slut and you're not empowered because you're, you know, uh, going and 
fornicating with like however many men you want to. It's like, no, you're going to wind up alone with cats and unhappy and you'll be like, oh, I'm a feminist. Why, wondering why men don't like you. That was quite a, a brutal assessment. But uh, as you said, you speak from experience. Yeah, I've been an empowered woman. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't get you anywhere. And it's like, oh, well, my experience can't speak to absolutely everybody's. I've met a lot of people. I've worked in a sick and twisted uh, industry for eight years. I'm 28, nearly 29 years old. And I've seen a lot in, in those years. Um, these women aren't empowered. They're sad and they're insecure. Now I want to ask you, uh, because, well, six months after we spoke, uh, Australia, including Victoria is thankfully a much, uh, freer place. Uh, we have, uh, no current state, state border restrictions and we, well, the, 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 the question around the, the COVID pandemic in Australia has turned to Australia's vaccine rollout. Now, it's, begin, it's starting to surge now with the, the local AstraZeneca vaccine being distributed to what is known as Priority Group 1B, which is those over 70 and those with pre-existing medical conditions. I'm not yeah, sure how close... I'm not sure how closely you've been following the developments on the the vaccine front, but there's ob obviously there's uh, been lots of uh, reports uh, from overseas of significant side effects, even even death. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, being was it coerced into taking the vaccine for quite some time. Uh, neither do I, but uh, what are your thoughts on what you've heard about the, the vaccine so far? Uh, well, like you said, um, rollout for the priority um, demographic, being the older ones, being the ones that don't contribute to the system anymore financially, they cannot be taxed. Instead, they are what you would consider like a burden to the system. So yeah, of course, they're a priority to vaccinate because they're a, they're a priority to basically eradicate. Um, because they don't, they don't bring in any more money. Uh, You're so implying that there's a sinister malice behind the, the, the vaccine rollout. Absolutely, I am. Yes, most certainly. Um, I mean, how, how can something that gives a recommendation that for women who are planning to conceive um, do not take the vaccine? It's like, well, hang on, isn't, isn't that kind of dangerous? Like, what's, it, what's in that? Um, there's certain, there's certain precautions that are going out saying like, oh, well, you shouldn't have it if, and then it's like, well, this, this is a problem. Why aren't people talking about that? And then it's really sad because there's, you see tweets that end up going viral, right? Of people being like, oh, I'm so tired of all you Karen anti-vaxxers saying um, that you won't get the vaccine. I just have the vaccine and then I feel fine. And then, um, you know, they say, uh, three four days later oh my um my six week old um baby you know they were pregnant um is is dead yeah uh, that those are heartbreaking tweets it's and tragic. You yeah and you wonder that basically having this uh, vaccine for propaganda like how can it be worth sacrificing your child which is mm. what what has resulted yeah yeah, I mean, like, I can't, I can't even believe it's like, it's massive. Um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? I'm having a, men a mental blank. Um, no, it's no. Uh, but basically, they're just like, they're, they're not able to, to see past, like, what's happening. They'll be like, make the connection that it's like, well, maybe, maybe these things are linked. There's like cognitive dissonance. That's the term I was looking for. There's massive cognitive dissonance around it. It's like, oh, but that wouldn't be from the vaccine because vaccines are proven safe. Yeah, by who? Oh, well, the, it, people would argue that the ultimate co uh, person demonstrating cognitive dissonance is the federal health minister, Greg Hunt, who two days after getting his AstraZeneca vaccine got cellulitis, uh, but he and his doctors were convinced nothing to do with the, the 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 vaccine and he was back at work the, the next week defending the astrazeneca vaccine uh, uh, despite a lot of european nations uh, suspending its rollout yeah 
Um, I mean, whether that's cognitive dissonance or like um, just being aware but going ahead with the coercion plan, um, depends how far down the rabbit hole we go, but I'd like to not go too far. <laughs> Yeah, oh, because this is going. This is on YouTube, so <laughs> we've, we've we've got to uh, got to keep it. Well, I, I, make make sure we know what's implied, but not be too explicit. I think the right people know. Um, you know, yeah, the right people know. Now, what are the your plans for the rest of twenty twenty one? Have you? I, I'm not sure if you've connected with the the freedom movement up in southeast Queensland. I know that another Victorian, James Bartolo, has also migrated uh, up there. He also went we viral today. over here. So, so you so, uh, so you have um, you. you you have connected with with him and the i know that up there's the the people's revolution that's the main pro-freedom group yeah um i haven't actually connected with the freedom community uh up here i've just been trying to stay away from anything that could grant me any more um publicity uh i don't like i said it's not like i actually want that kind of um attention from the media i mean obviously we're sitting here doing an interview but i'd like to set my story straight this isn't mm. going to be broadcast for the millions you know it'd be great if it was actually because then people could know the truth but um yeah i don't put it this way i definitely don't want the negative attention of course i don't want that i um i don't want to be you know have people coming up to me and like asking me questions uh, you know oh what's happening next or like what can can you lead us and do this like i had so many people messaging me saying like oh can you please share this can you you're a figurehead you're an influencer in this i don't want to be that i do not want to be that person um i'm not interested in in being a leader at least not right now like i'm still reading and learning so much and i would say that um my energy has actually been more focused on um, the things politically that are happening behind uh, what's happening now that shows that this is actually all a plan that's, that's been orchestrated and putting into place. So uh, looking at certain political figures and demographics and stuff that contribute to uh, the situation. I know that that's very, very um, ambiguous what I'm saying, but I think for my own well-being, I need to remain ambiguous. But I've been doing a lot of, uh, a lot of investigating as to, yeah, the powers that be. I'll, uh, I'll say that. And so because of that, um, I think, yeah, I think that be finding that out has made me realize that uh, fighting for our freedoms is really great. We need people doing that, but I actually want to see a little bit more deeply who's really behind all of what's happening in the world so yeah that's where i'm focusing my energy instead yeah uh, there's still a lot to unfold with this uh, pandemic and uh, the vaccine rollout for the rest of of tw 2021 there's no guarantee that anything will ever be like the well not the the old normal because the the old normal there was still uh, a lot of crackdowns on freedom and free speech but there, there definitely was a time the the old old normal that was was really good yeah when was that i think i was only a baby when that was still the case because i'm born in 92 so <laughs> Well, it was the end of well, the the first incarnation of of communism, uh, the, the the early late eighties, early nineties. So, yes, that was yeah. a good time. Yeah. Um, oh, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, like, I'm not on so well. Technically, I guess it is social media, but I'm not on the conventional platforms of social media, being uh, Telegram, Twitter, Facebook. That sorry, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, that type of thing. But I am on Telegram, and I'm in some what you might consider rather controversial um, uh, online places. Um, it's 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 very fun. Uh, the right wing makes some good memes, um, but I. Um, I've noticed that even on Telegram, things are getting censored because, yeah, they don't want the truth out there. Oh, that's Apple and uh, Google on the the apps because, uh, although because obviously 
uh, Telegram, more people are more people are discovering it because it's in the the app stores. Uh, but the the sacrifice is that certain content is not allowed to be on there. Yeah, um, which is not really right. Freedom of information. Um, and it's not just like Apple and Google, like I don't know if they've actually done that to the point where they've made it undownloadable so that you can't find it. Actually, no, that's not the case because I asked a friend of mine to download Telegram the other day. Yeah, they, but, uh, they obviously, uh, Gab was the first to be kicked off the, the, the app stores and then after the, uh, the, the storming of the, the US Capitol, they kicked Parler off. So, yep. but uh, Telegram has still continues to survive well uh when i say the censorship on telegram i don't necessarily mean that they've made the app entirely inaccessible i mean that certain pages uh have been shut down oh yes that's definitely the the, the case you get that message uh this isn't accessible on this app and so you have to go to the uh the desktop version of that to see what's all that about yeah, but actually just channels, like an entire Telegram channel with potentially thousands of subscribers gone, nuked. I haven't come across any of those channels. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in a few of those. <laughs> well, it's been great to, to catch up with you. And well, I, I'm glad I was able to uh, give you the opportunity uh, to, to, to set the 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 recent reporting uh, straight and and give us an update on how, you, how you've been doing, how you've been living uh, this past six months. And well, let's hope that well, things at least slowly improve. They get slightly less crap. Let's put it like that. Praying for it. Take care. Thanks for having me, Tim. Um, and I'd just like to say that anyone out there, I know that I was previously promoting my Instagram at the very least for the moment, I've taken time off of that. It's completely deactivated, not using it. Don't have the intention to go back on anytime soon, but for the period of Lent, I'm off uh, social media entirely. So I'm not using my Telegram channel, but I do have a Telegram channel. Sorry, it's not going to be too politically overt or anything crazy. I don't want to get deleted or anything on there, but I am, um, posting content and just sharing stuff on there. If anyone wants to find me on there, it's um, T-H-E-E-V-E-O-L-U-T-I-O-N. Um, if anyone wants to find me on Telegram, that's my channel on there. I'll, I'll um, provide so yeah, a link to it in the description uh, so people can find, find you after. Yeah, cool. Well, Tim, thank you so much for having me. I um, yeah, I feel good about being able to set the story straight and expand on a few other things. Um, I, I feel like I, I want to say that I don't want to need to come back on and set the story set the story straight again, but they seem to like coming after me, so who knows? <laughs> Maybe I'll need to. <laughs> well, we'll see. Your next court appearance is ju in July. We'll see if there's any more legal and media shenanigans. Probably will be. <laughs> All the best. Thanks, Tim. You too. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.